Thank you so much. Now, but before I start, let me just sort of get a sense of the room. Um, how many of you have studied or practiced in or mooted about international arbitration? So mostly people who are less familiar. Um, well, it, what already came up a little bit in the panel discussion before is that international arbitration is a bit of, well, we, it's kind of half-jokingly called a mafia. There's an arbitration mafia out there and uh, we're all over the world and um, there's very, well, there's comparatively little that, that seeps out other than what we ourselves write about it. Um, now, I'm by no means a capo of the arbitration mafia, but more a little peon. Um, but let me give you a little bit of a background about why interim measures matter before getting into the enforcement mechanism. Um, interim measures are at this point significantly on the rise in international arbitration. Uh, I would say that uh, somewhere around 80% of cases uh, that go to arbitration will begin either with an interim measures application or a um, security for costs application. So it's something that has huge significance. Now why does it have huge significance? Most transactions that have arbitration clauses in them involve special purpose vehicles of some kind. What I mean by special purpose vehicles is that it's not, I don't know, um, Siemens versus um, Samsung or something like that. It's that they would usually form subsidiary companies for purposes of achieving a specific venture. And it is the contract between these two subsidiaries that includes an arbitration clause. So the subsidiaries in question, if certainly the transaction involved large law firms, would not have a lot of money. Uh, they would be adequately capitalized to do what they need to do on a day-to-day -day basis, but they don't have significant, significant amounts in cash just lying around. Um, which means that in order to make an arbitral award effective in the final analysis, interim measures are really important to make sure that you don't just go through the arbitration proceeding to get a worthless piece of paper at the end of the day. Um, so that implies that having interim measures that are actually enforceable also matters. I mean, you usually say it'd be a very bad idea to disregard an interim measures order by an arbitral tribunal. Why wouldn't parties just comply voluntarily for the most part, if they have money to satisfy a final award, they would. Or if they're the plaintiff, it'd be a bad idea if you're asking somebody for relief and then ignore what they're telling you to do. Um, but if you're dealing with these thinly capitalized special purpose vehicles, you have a real issue that you need to find a way to make the relief that arbitral tribunals order effective as fast as possible. Now, the typical way that you would make arbitral relief effective is by means of enforcement, recognition and enforcement through the New York Convention. Have most of you heard generally about the, 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 the New York Convention? Yes. Well, it's not the only international treaty that deals with the recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards, but it really it has 149 parties. Georgia, I, I looked yesterday, uh, was a member since 1994. Um, and the convention applies fundamentally to foreign awards, meaning awards that are issued outside of the country where enforcement is sought, or otherwise awards that are considered non-domestic by the local jurisdiction, which sometimes happens if you have foreign parties involved. Um, the nationality of the parties doesn't matter. So you don't have to have a, nation a nationality of a treaty party to the New York Convention, have the benefit of the New York Convention. 
and um, states can exclude certain kinds of relationships that are considered non-commercial as a matter of domestic law from the scope of the New York Convention. Now, the problem, though, is that the New York Convention applies to awards. What is an award? Well, typically, an award is defined as a final determination either as to the entirety or at least a part of the case. Interim relief, by definition, appears to be non-final because it can be changed at a later point in time by the tribunal. It only affects a procedural disposition with regard to the parties for a period of time. So, um, fundamentally, many jurisdictions, if not most jurisdictions, applying the New York Convention would quite simply say that the New York Convention is inapplicable to truly interim relief. Um, now, that creates quite some problems, because one of the most important things for you to achieve the final remedy that you want is to get an interim award, and yet you can't enforce the interim award by means of the principal convention that is out there in order to deal with arbitration. Um, now, the first way that people in arbitration deal with this is quite simply a little bit of language games. Namely, we don't try to get interim relief. At any stage possible, we try to get partial relief. And we try to figure out how on earth we can change the request that we have to something that sounds final, something that sounds like it disposes of a part of the case without giving leave to the tribunal, essentially to reconsider what it has done. Um, let's see if we can come up with one of those clever ways. Um, freezing orders was one of the questions. If you had to ask an arbitral tribunal for a freezing order with regard to certain assets, how would you go about that if you had to make that freezing order something other than temporary? Do any of you have an idea? How do you make a freezing order a partial and final disposition of the case? Anyone have an idea? Can you rephrase the question? Sure. It, it, you try, you're trying to get a freezing order from an arbitral tribunal. A freezing order, if you termed it in classical terms, is temporary. You say, for the duration of these proceedings, arrest these funds. You couldn't get that enforced under the New York Convention. So now the question is, how do you rephrase your request for relief so that what you're asking the tribunal to do is something permanent? Maybe we can call it like a partial award. Yes. So the first thing you would do is you'd ask for a partial award. The problem is, what the tribunal calls its relief is not dispositive. A court will look at the relief actually granted to a point. And so if there is a freezing order that says for the pendency of these proceedings, all assets in the following accounts are frozen, it doesn't matter that it's called partial award. It would still not be enforceable. How do you improve that one more step so that it looks like an award in the dispositif? Order, and unless it is then changed by the, 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 the problem.
problem is the unless language. If there is anything that says unless, or that expressly reserves reconsideration on the part of the tribunal, you're in New York Convention trouble. So you, you, you're precisely getting in the right direction. What tribunals will do to cheat this is to say, party A, pay amount of money X into account Y, which is a trustee account, which the tribunal can then say at the end of the day, account holder for account A will now be party B. So then you're no longer undoing what you've already done. You're essentially just saying, well, you know, party A, pay this. That looks like a final award. And the reconsideration isn't the reconsideration of the, well, don't pay money or unfreeze the account. It is how the money in this account is dispersed, who the account holder is at the end of the day. And that is a way in which tribunals are trying to get around this. It's no longer a freeze. It is actually an order, an award of money. It's just that the award of money has certain modalities about it as to how it is to be performed. And their courts will wink, wink, nudge, nudge along and say, okay, we're going to be formalistic about this and consider that this is a final disposition of a part of the case rather than a temporary disposition. If you were truly functional about it, of course the court knows that this is something that is the equivalent of a freezing order and that the tribunal is fudging. But because of the central importance of interim measures in that context, they're perfectly willing to go along so long as they are given a pretext for it. Yeah. So um, it's, it's a matter of repping, actually, like how you rep that yeah. interim award. But so in that case, um, and how, um, how um, open are the courts to kind of uh, follow that? Uh, it's, I mean, to, they essentially, they, they see that it's not a final award. It's just wrapped as a final award. But the content is not a final disposition. So are all, how I'm um, interested how open are courts in various jurisdictions, how, how popular it is to, that they follow this in. You know, they, they recognize it as a New York Convention it, it, It's a bend, don't break kind of thing. So long as you're bending the rule and you're staying within a plausible rationalization of why this is final, courts will go along with you. They let you bend and they're happy because they know just about how central this is for an arbitral tribunal to have effective jurisdiction over the dispute. If you're breaking it by making it so transparently pretextual, they don't have a choice. But so long as they're given really a read of plausibility, they're going to come along with you. So that the art for counsel in these cases is to phrase it in a way that gives the courts, you know, the, the, the branch to allow them to say, okay, we're going to now build all of this out of this little branch. If you don't give them that opportunity, they, don't have, they, they feel like they're constrained by the language of the convention. And the problem is that the courts cannot redo your remedy for you. So if a tribunal says it's an interim freezing order, they cannot say, well, yes, let's repackage this. I can enforce something if only they had said this, so I'm not going to do it ex officio at the court level. Um, so this clever pleading is something that is instrumental at the first stage when the parties are trying to come up with arguments. Um, now, your arbitral tribunals, if they're experienced arbitrators, are going to very seriously suggest to the parties, well, could you think of another way to ask me to grant you relief? I am concerned that the way that you have phrased your request will not allow me to render an efficacious redress to the parties in light of their concern. That they're not going to plead it for you, but they're going to very heavily hint that the parties have asked the wrong way. So if, if you're in a situation like that, um, it, it, that's a soft, in, in American terms, we call that a softball. They're lobbing something at you to 
change what you're asking for because they're telling you what you're doing is nice in theory, but it won't work. So then work with your tribunal to change it. Um, now, it's, there are certain other types of asset freezes that are similarly easy uh, to do that don't involve money. If you have goods that are an issue, uh, Klaus-Peter Berger has a, a famous example of fruit. It's a fruit contract and the fruit sits in a warehouse. Just order the fruit to be sold and the proceeds from the fruit to be put in a certain account. That similarly works. Um, so those kind of remedies are relatively easy to squeeze by the New York Convention, are relatively easy to get into a partial award form. You just have to think about, oh, okay, interim gets me into trouble. The problem is there are certain kinds of relief that you really cannot put into that form. We talked about the arrest of a ship. Making that a partial award is going to start straining credulity. I order that a new captain be appointed. Well, no. That's, that's not going to work. So there are certain forms where you simply don't have a choice. Um, the other thing we're, and we're going to talk about this later on, because we've had the question already, any kind of interim relief that concerns the suspension of inconsistent litigation it's going to be incredibly difficult to term in terms of a partial award, simply because you have limitations periods. If you're ordering a party to dismiss a case, and it's close to the time that the limitations period on the underlying action would run, it, you're fundamentally prejudicing their rights. So in those contexts, you really don't get around having interim relief rather than partial final relief. So in those cases, the question then becomes, hmm, okay, we're outside of the New York Convention. Am I totally without means to enforce this relief or not? And luckily, it, many jurisdictions have recognized the need to give some form of effective redress even in those circumstances. Again, part of the reason for that is that interim relief in especially a civilian context go to the efficacy of arbitration in the first place. A tribunal is authorized to issue interim relief in order to protect its effective jurisdiction. So if you wouldn't have a means in domestic law to give effect to them, you might as well not have an arbitration. It's just a waste of money. So many uh, jurisdictions have recognized that we must have some form of statutory or common law, by which I don't mean necessarily U.S. or English common law, but um, jurisprudential basis to enforce um, interim measures. Now, we already mentioned the uncentral model law in um, the first set of remarks. And the 2006 uncentral model law in Article 17 H and I makes express that interim measures orders are to be enforceable on the same lines as New York Convention awards in countries that have adopted the 2006 model law. That fundamentally means that so long as the arbitration agreement itself is valid, so long as due process was granted the parties, so long as the tribunal has acted within his powers, and the other grounds for set aside, I'm not gonna run through all of them, uh, are satisfied, so long all of that is satisfied, a uncertain model law jurisdiction under the 2006 law certainly would enforce that decision. The problem is the kind of confusion that could arise out of the earlier version of the uncertain model law of 1985. 
Uh, Article 17 in the 1985 law is far less specific about what happens once a court has, uh, once an arbitral tribunal has ordered interim measures. So if you're in a jurisdiction that applies the 1985 law, courts could easily In the United States, we do not have a statutory ground to enforce interim measures orders. However, some courts have recognized that in the right sets of circumstances, they're going to simply go along with the arbitral tribunal and enforce the decision of the arbitral tribunal to make effective the choice of remedies of arbitration. So in, in those jurisdictions, you'd have a somewhat convoluted and less predictable set of jurisprudential relief rather than the statutory relief that the 2006 UNCITRA model law clearly gives you. Now, 2006 model law jurisdictions, you wouldn't have a problem. You're essentially going ahead. The, the problem that you had under the New York Convention is fixed for you. Um, the problem, though, is that you're still stuck in that position, depending on where you need to enforce the interim measures, that you may not get the interim measures relief enforced outright. You may have to re-argue your case for interim relief in the domestic courts where you're seeking the freeze of assets, for instance. And then you're stuck under a completely different regime than what you might be used to in arbitration. Now, asset freeze. One of the bases that uh, parties love to, to, to seek is to freeze bank accounts, especially if you have some semblance of an idea where, where somebody banks. Um, one of the most famous examples of this is Mobil Cero Negro against uh, Pedevesa. Uh, you may remember that Venezuela migrated the oil and gas projects uh, in the uh, Orinoco Belt, essentially nationalizing them, that there were some companies, principally ExxonMobil and ConocoPhillips, that were simply not willing to settle, given that they challenged the underlying legislative action as confiscatory, and started arbitrations. Immediately, they sought, even before they started arbitrations, they sought freezing orders in New York, they sought freezing orders in London, and in the Dutch Antilles. These freezing orders were relatively famous because at one point or another, I think it was somewhere north of $85 billion worldwide that were frozen. Um, and that is one way in which you can use courts effectively, even ex ante, before you have an arbitral proceeding, to give yourself effective relief. How common is this? Common. To the extent that you can figure out where to run with your request for interim measures, you're going to try your very best to freeze bank accounts. Why? Well, one, it helps you make sure that you will have funds available to satisfy your award. But also, it, it, it certainly grabs the attention of the other side. If you have frozen significant assets, you've just made sure that the other side is seriously thinking about whether or not to settle this case. Because an arbitration can take time, and the money is stranded for the duration. Most businesses cannot do without significant funds that are sitting in these accounts. So you've now created significant pressure on the other side to settle. So fundamentally, that's one of the concerns that goes into seeking these freezing orders. The problem is that in order to get a freezing order as a matter of New York law, and so much of banking runs through New York that it's a critical jurisdiction for this, you need to prove irreparable harm as one of your elements. The problem that you have is that irreparable harm in international arbitration in the interim measures context, while an element means something completely different than it does in New York. Um, I'm sure that in Georgian law, 
if you're seeking interim measures, you would have something like an irreparable harm requirement as well. Let me ask first, do you have an irreparable harm requirement if you're seeking interim relief in Georgian court proceedings? Do you have to prove that there is an irreparable harm you would suffer if the measure were not ordered? Yes. And, and what do you mean by irreparable harm? It's subject to interpretation. <laughs> well, what are the various interpretations that are out there? Oh, you have just to prove that uh, there, was, there is really the harm, that uh, there is the expectation that someone will uh, dispose the asset or uh, it's, it's really individually, case by case. There is no unified approach mm -hmm. established by the court that you can refer to. The interesting thing that in other civil law jurisdictions, irreparable harm tends to mean that the object of the dispute is in danger. You have a contract for the sale of goods, there's a problem with the goods. Now, you're proceeding in personam and you're claiming for money damages, but the fact that you're claiming for money damages does not deprive you of an argument that there could be irreparable harm. It, it, does that track with what is going on in, in Georgia sometimes? Yes, we, we could say so. <laughs> Our law says that the party has to prove that the non-issuance uh, non of the interim measure may cause uh, uh, a, da a damage uh, which cannot be compensated by money monetary relief. Mm -hmm. so. now, Georgian law then is much closer to the New York standards, so it will not come as quite as much of a surprise if you plead the wrong case. A breach of contract action in which you seek general damages precludes you, as a general rule, from getting a freezing order. You cannot prove irreparable harm simply because you're asking for money. If you're asking for money in its own right, unless you can prove fraudulent conduct on the part of the party whom you're asking, whose assets you're asking to be frozen, too bad. Requesting money destroys irreparable harm. Now, many civilians find that somewhat shocking. I mean, most arbitration practitioners would say, no, irreparable harm means something completely different. It means that the subject matter of my arbitration is somehow um, uh, in danger, that there is fundamentally a deterioration of the dispute. That's what we mean by irreparable harm. So again, if you look at uh, Professor Berger, he expressly says no irreparable harm does not mean that a claim for money damages completely divests you of a right to interim relief in arbitration. The problem is if you've pled your case in a way that's consistent with international arbitration principles, in a way, say, a German lawyer or a French lawyer might plead the case just out of sheer habit, and now you go to New York and you try to enforce or otherwise get interim relief there, you have precluded yourself from the relief that you're trying to get. Because you're asked for money damages, that's it. There's a trick though. Again, there's something you can do in order to improve your lie, which is a re-wrapping of your request. What the New York courts have allowed is claims of fundamentally disgorgement, where the disgorgement that you are seeking is the money that you're going after. It, it, let me ask, because disgorgement is somewhat of a, a, a technical term. Do you understand what I mean by it? Or let me explain more. If you have a claim of conversion, theft, and you say that the money, the proceeds of the theft, sits in a specific amount, in a specific account, you would ask for the proceeds of the theft to be returned to you. 
you would disgorge the benefit of the crime and ask for the specific proceeds. That, that would be the disgorgement measure. Now, if you allege that the money in the account is your money to start with, you can ask a New York court to freeze that account. How would you go about that? You bring a delictual cause of action. You, you, you proceed both for breach of contract and for tort, so that the tort cause of action gives you the ability to say that the money in that account is my money, return it to me. You plead it that way, you have a chance to get the New York courts to grant you your relief. Now, typically, it's not that somebody steals your money. It's not that somebody holds money in trust for you and are, or, it, 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 you know, the people are running around spending it. What usually happens is that you have a relationship where um, somebody makes money on your behalf, sell oil or something like that, and it's the proceeds from the sale that sits in the account. And you have a right to the object, therefore you have a right to the proceeds. That's fine. So long as you can assert that there is a connection between you and the money, you can get your freezing order. But if you forget to plead that case, and you just say, well, um, I'm afraid that the other party doesn't have enough money, here is money that belongs to the other party, just freeze it, you're not going to get anywhere. You have to specifically assert why you want that money. Um, incidentally, something that would happen to you with American arbitrators too. Most American arbitrators are going to have a very knee-jerk reaction to um, issue a freezing order unless they're given a reason why on earth that money belongs to you rather than the other party. The answer that you would get from most New York arbitrators is, well, if you wanted a guarantee, you should have gotten a guarantee. We're not here to provide a guarantee ex post. You had to negotiate for that. If you didn't get the security you wanted for your commercial transaction, tough. Um, so you have to prove that you're not in that position in the context of American arbitrators and American courts. Um, now, to wrap up, there are a few pleading points that really come out of this that are kind of like the how-to from the arbitration mafia. One, to the extent possible, always plead for a partial award wrap up your interim measures request as one that isn't just interim relief, but is final relief as to something. Explain to the tribunal how the relief you're asking for fundamentally protects the efficacy of the remainder of what follows. If we do not do this now, we might as well stop the proceedings. Um, that helps you with regard to non unsatral model, non-2006 unsatral model law jurisdictions to explain why on earth it is that they should enforce this particular order. Um, plead the case in such a way that you assert a specific right to the specific thing that you're trying to attach. That means that you frequently will not just claim for a breach of contract, but you'll claim for a tort or other statutory entitlement. Hopefully you drafted your arbitration clause in such a way that you're permitted to do that, even if you're not, argue that you are and see what the tribunal does. Uh, sometimes tribunals are willing to give you a, a, a connection arising out of the contract may very well mean well the tort is so intricately interwoven with the contract that even though generally a statutory cause of action wouldn't fall within your arbitration agreement, this one does. Give it a try. Um, and the most important thing is, before you even start your case, you need to know what it is that your final money pool is with which you're going to satisfy your, your award so that you can plan ahead as to how you're going to argue your case. Because if you don't do that, you're going to end up with a client that's going to have spent, I don't know, um, anywhere between $250,000 and $12 million on your legal fees, and has a wonderful award that says that they're entitled to, I don't know, 
a billion dollars in damages, except that the award debtor is judgment proof. Your client's not going to be very happy with you in that case. So you have to you have to figure it out at the front end so that you can plead your interim measures appropriately, win them, win your case, once you've won your case, establish your entitlement to the money again, and then proceed against the money. So that's, so I think I've right about stayed on time. Um, and um, would love to, to engage you with, with, with some question and answer and, and, and see if there's anything else I can help. Um, Thank you for it. Are there any questions? Can you name some successful cases where interim measures were enforced by state courts? Um, the, the most successful cases aren't necessarily enforcement cases. Mobile Cerro Negro is really the most successful case because before the um, ICC arbitration in question even started, <laughs> they arrested the funds. So if, if you wait until you start the arbitration and then you try to seek an enforcement of interim measures, you're kind of too late in most instances. Um, other than that, I have a file of cases that I could um, s send, I mean, they're, they're mostly U.S. cases and, and uh, a Swiss case as well, um, but they're not easily available. So what I would suggest to do, if it would be helpful, is to send an email um, those cases, I've excerpted them for my class, um, and then we, I'm sure we could, could, we, we could make them available so that you can have a look at how these cases go about it. There's a Swiss case, and I want to say two U.S. cases, and I can see if I can fish out Mobile Cerro Negro again. Uh, it's one of those decisions that was out briefly and then all of a sudden vanished. It's not necessarily a reported decision. Um, but those would be the cases that I'd mostly point to as really successful cases of interim measures enforcement. Any further questions? Sopo Mireila, please. It seems to me that it's not, sometimes it's a matter of tactics. Sometimes it may be, um, um, maybe better to go right to the, depending on the jurisdiction, but to the courts rather than to the tribunal. To take example of Georgia, like if um, any party would have to freeze um, an asset in Georgia, a ship for example, now that we have this decision and there is no uh, any more uncertainty, to go to the tribunal and um, incur all the costs of the uh, arbitrators to issue interim measure, then to come to the national court and ask recognition and enforcement of the interim measure, I mean, just go directly to the court, and if that procedural law of the court, like it is in Georgia, allows, it may be much faster um, to go that way. Uh, yes, there, there are three exceptions, I think. Um, the, the, the first is sometimes you have a more lenient standard in your arbitral tribunal for the issuance of interim relief than you would in the courts. So an arbitral tribunal would be loath to lose effective jurisdiction over a case where a court may be more reluctant to issue the relief. And in those cases, and, and that's really a jurisdiction by jurisdiction approach, in those cases it's better to wait, get your easier test and win. Um, then a special example of that, just to, just to tease a little bit for later, maybe anti-suit injunctions might be one such circumstance where you might have an easier time. We may see in the afternoon panel um, uh, it, it, for relief from a tribunal. I, I, I know that tribunals are, are far, it, tribunals are anti-suit injunction happy for the most part, whereas courts, while not necessarily hostile, are not quite as, you know, Wait a minute, you're interfering with my jurisdiction? Stop that. Um, the third is, again, tactics. Interim measures requests 
are a means to plead your case in the best light possible immediately when the tribunal is constituted and to make the other side look like real crooks. Um, so what parties love to do is bring interim measures requests just as a means to strengthen their theme in the arbitration so that the arbitrators already have a feeling that here is a bad apple on the other side and to just tar the equities from the very early going. And the party in that case doesn't even care about whether they get efficacious relief. They just care about you know, painting the other side as just you know, criminals. Um, and in that case, it's better to do that in the arbitration than to already have a remedy in place. Because if there's already a remedy in place, the tribunal's not going to pay attention. They're not going to think that they are needed to protect the poor victim that is asking them for relief against this horrible, horrible other party. Um, and you'd be amazed how many times that trick works. I mean, again, sort of like, you know, from the toolkit of the mafia. Um, but um, yeah, it's not. It's not like there's anything wrong with doing that. In many instances, there really is a legitimate need to do it. There is a legitimate need for protection that the tribunal can issue far more readily, because, especially if it's cross-jurisdictional. Um, but, I mean, I've been in a case relatively recently where it was absolutely obvious that that was going on. The other side refused our overture to give them precisely what they wanted precisely what the tribunal ordered at the end, we had offered at the beginning, and they said, no, we don't want that. We want the issue. It's politics. Is there a discussion you are aware of to modify the of New York Convention, convention to, to impose any kind of interim relief uh, like it was in two, like uh, 2008 modification of model law to make uh, to make life of attorneys and arbitrators easier <laughs> and to not to uh, force them to wrap this uh, you know interim relief request into final final award. So it's difficult. I mean, they, they, they've done inter they, they've done um, statements of interpretation as a means to try to do something in that direction, but. Any time you're trying to amend a multilateral convention with 149 signatory states, you're looking at a, at, at a close to impossibility. Um, so the, the 2006 Uncentral Model Law, in a way, is the interpretive statement that would suggest that, well, when we set a ward, we really meant to include interim relief. We just it wasn't yet time to do it. And so that's the way in which the Uncentral Arbitration Group kind of tried to wrap its head around the problem. Um, I think most courts that deal frequently with arbitration are aware of it and are kind of dealing with it as best they can. Uh, but the effort of getting that change, I think, would be too monumental a task to try, especially because many countries would try to find other ways to make other political pet peeves something that's on the agenda. So pro-arbitration countries would probably not want to open that can of worms right now. Jürgen? Uh, you might be aware about the practice of emergency arbitrators that has become common in international arbitration. Uh, the question is whether um, uh, reliefs that, or just awards that are rendered by such arbitrators uh, fall within the scope of model law and can be enforced as interim measures, as ordinary interim measures issued by the tribunal. I wouldn't see why not. Um, the practice in the United States has been to enforce AAA emergency arbitrator relief in ICDR cases quite readily in the courts. Now, mind you, that's under the Federal Arbitration Act, not the 2006 Uncitral Model Law, but the Uncitral, 2006 Uncitral Model Law gives you more reason 
to enforce than the FAA. So I think that you should readily get that enforced if you're in the right jurisdiction and the courts feel like the um, emergency arbitrator did not violate due process rights. I mean, that's the key problem because they act so fast that notice, proper notice of a hearing and um, appropriate hearing of the parties is just something that you could easily run afoul of. Um, but I think most of the emergency arbitrators are going to make sure that they hold the hearing before they issue the relief, uh, which makes the emergency arbitrator far less effective. But, um, I mean, you know, oh, I would want to arrest that ship you're about to move from port. Can we talk about that? Uh, yeah, give me an hour until I've moved the ship. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's part of the problem of, of, of doing that. So there, I think, it's really right that you need to run to the courts for that kind of relief. I find the emergency arbitrator a very nice invention, but ultimately it doesn't work because when there is a true emergency, yeah. a, a, a due process rights are just the wrong kind of idea. I mean, that's why you issue that kind of interim relief ex parte first and then set the hearing rather than set the hearing first. Thank you, Fred. Uh, One more question and Agnishnuli Sahis, who's not of his own is the Gamor and Eba, Chen Sasan of Los Mirs and Scott Shiat, where the Badas, the Connarnishnet, Magal Tiro de Sacheleba, to cut Meorem Harris, give a hilly Sats of Shida Adaro. And Uram Kitsebuleba, Arisachiro, Misatis, Rots Arad Ginot, and Kitsebuleba, my intercepts the retard. Chuentan Dairos, concretely Kitsebuleba, Magal Tatuzra, Connebar, its Huli Rosajero, Shida, Sashem de Bozra, which Giviano. Kids have been very much interested. Saban ko angar shi bishem tkhoashi. Daka daka bismat khoni shem tkhoashi. Ram kids have been very much interested. Ad genili arbitrash. Malut. Da am da wasustep. Asewe mudzra u khone bastan da kaushire bi tromel tsararis registre de bolu shualo tresh. Malut. The evidence that you need both really more pragmatically but also legally is to know what the account is which, with which bank at what branch and to determine that the account at the bank at that branch actually belongs to the right party. Um, so if you go to Chase Manhattan Bank and you, know, you tell it to freeze an account one, you're ordering at that point Chase Manhattan Bank to freeze the account. Um, and they're going to say, well, you know, that's nice, but we need to make sure that it's the right person's account. Um, and so just a freezing order that would not have the name of the party, the account number, and the branch number is going to do you very little good. Because assume you had a freezing order that simply says all assets of Acme Corporation, uh, from Roadrunner fame, um, ac all accounts of Acme Corporation in New York are hereby frozen. It doesn't do you any good because you still have to find the accounts in question. I mean, the, 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 the person is just going to run around and deplete those accounts at will. So what you really need is the account number, the account holder. You need to, you need to make the bank stop, which means that the bank needs to be ordered to stop. And the bank is only going to be ordered to stop if you can prove that there is a sufficient jurisdictional link, not only between the bank account and the party in the arbitration, but per the New York case, you need to also prove that they are actually related to the uh, transaction at issue in the arbitration. And this is more of a pragmatic answer than a strictly legal answer you could get legal freezing orders that are broader than that, but fundamentally you're not going to be able to get the benefit of them. Those are just for show. Thank you. 